Hello and welcome to 2.2, Limit of a Function and Limit Laws. Today in this section we're looking at how certain functions behave when uh, they're evaluated near certain points. Like for example, certain x values here. If we plug in, what happens to the function around that point? So in this first example, we look at how the function, we have a rational function here, behaves near x equal to 1. Now this is interesting because if we plug in the value of 1 into our function, we end up with 1 squared minus 1 over... 1 minus 1. 1 squared is 1 minus 1 is 0. 1 minus 1 on the bottom is 0. We end up with 0 over 0, which is what we call an indeterminate form. which doesn't tell us much, right? We don't know what 0 over 0 is. It's an undefined uh, value. So what we do is we try doing various things. As you guys may remember from the unit on rational functions in Algebra 2, we try to factor this rational function. Okay, we know that the top part would factor uh, x squared minus 1 is a difference of squares. So we factor this as x plus 1 times x minus 1. The denominator is x minus 1. And then what we could do is cancel a common factor of x minus 1. And we're just left with x plus 1. So what this tells us is that this function in general, right, will, for the most part, behave like this function down here. Right? Now we all know what this function looks like if we set f of x equals x plus 1. This is our linear function. Right? This one has a slope of 1, has a y-intercept of 1, and we all know what the graph would look like. It would be something, something like this. Now the key difference to the graph of this x plus 1 function and the function that we were presented with is at 1, because we have this indeterminate form, uh, let's put, let's put our point for when x is 1. When x is 1, we have an indeterminate form. So we end up putting a, a circle, which symbolizes a, a hole meaning that function does not have a value at that point, okay? So what ends up happening is the overall graph looks like x plus 1 with the key difference that there is a hole when x is 1. So what happens to the function as x gets near x equals 1? So if we look at the function, as x gets closer to 1, uh, let's say we're starting from the left here, looking at the graph. As we get closer to 1, what's happening to the y value of this function? Right, the y value is approaching uh, a certain number. Right? Now let's look at it also from the other end. If we're approaching 1, from the right, and we're getting closer and closer going this way, what's happening to the function 
we notice our function is coming down this way. What value does it seem to be approaching from both sides? Seems to be approaching the value of 2. Right, so I think we're all in agreement there. Now, this can happen, and we would say that the limit of this function as x approaches 1 would be 2, from the mere fact that the function appears to be approaching 2 from the left, and it appears to be approaching 2 from the right. Okay, let's take a look at another example. Here we have uh, three scenarios, uh, and in each scenario, it looks like the function is approaching, as x is approaching 1, the function is approaching 2. Okay, so if you notice, uh, the, the first one on the left, this is our example from uh, part from example 1. Okay, we have the same function drawn. We have the whole at x equals 1. So the limit here would be 2. Okay, even though when we plug in 1, we have a, a whole. Now, here we have a piecewise function in, in the middle here for b. The piecewise function is defined as g of x. So for everywhere x is not 1, we have this function, and when x equals 1, we have it equal to 1. Okay, so uh, we could say that this function is defined for all uh, x, uh, and the limit, even though when x is 1, we get a value of 1, the limit would be 2 as x approaches 1, because uh, the limit approaches, just like in the first one, it approaches 2 from both ends. Okay, and then in C, we have just a regular x plus 1 function, um, defined for all points, and again, the limit would be 2. So here we see three different ways of uh, showing uh, three different versions, I should say, and in each version, the limit of the functions uh, are all two. Okay. Let's take a look at example three. Find the limits of the identity function and of a constant function as x approaches x equals c. Okay. So for an identity function, Identity function is simply the function of x, like if we say y equals x. So here let's introduce some limit notation. We would say limit, and then we would say x approaches, let's say, 2. And then our function would be here, function is x. So what ends up happening is, as x approaches 2, our identity function would be 2. We just, if you were to graph the identity function, y equals x, right? As x equals 1, y equals 1. As x equals uh, 1.5, y equals 1.5. As x equals 3, y equals 3. So as x equals 2, y equals 2. So here the limit would be 2. Okay, a constant function. So if we said uh, limit as x approaches negative 3, and let's say the constant function is 4. Okay, so when you picture this, you want to picture the constant function y equals 4. Think y equals 4. 
So in y equals 4, you know that the graph of y equals 4 is a horizontal line. And so as you approach uh, negative 3, you'll see that your function will still be 4. Right? In fact, whatever value you, you approach, let's say as x approaches um, 5, as x approaches 5, for the function 4, we still end up with 4. Okay, and that's one of the things about a, a constant function. You'll always have that value of the constant function no matter what x you're approaching. Okay. Okay, let's take a look at our next example. Discuss the behavior of the following functions, explaining why they have no limit as x approaches 0. Okay, so in each of these cases, we have to look at the graphs. Okay, we have to look at the graphs, and we have to look at what's happening as x approaches 0. Okay, so let me bring up the graphs in each case. So for part A, uh, we have the one on the left is the unit step function. In the unit step function, we see that uh, the function is 0 for x less than 0. And it's 1 for x greater than or equal to 0. Okay, and we see what's happening as x as x approaches 0. So to answer that question, we look at what's happening to this function as we get closer and closer to x equals 0. Now x equals 0 is the y-axis. Right? So what's happening as we go like this, and what's happening as we go like this? So starting from the right and go heading left towards our y-axis, we notice the function is approaching 1. And then, starting from the left and heading right, our function is approaching 0. So as we're approaching 0 from both ends, uh, the limit of the function is approaching two different values. From one end, it's approaching 1. From the other end, it's approaching 0. So, because the limit does not match from both ends, we would say here that the limit does not exist. Okay, we would say there's no limit. Or you could say the limit... DNE does not exist. Okay, let's take a look at the part B. It says we have G of X where the function is 1 over X when X is not 0 and the function is 0 when X equals 0. Okay, so here's our point of 0 when X equals 0. And then here's our 1 over x. It's this function with the asymptote in the middle here for the y-axis and a horizontal asymptote for the x-axis. So as x approaches 0 here, uh, we look at what's happening from the right going to the middle. And we notice it's going to be increasing towards positive infinity. As we come from the left going right, we notice it's going to be decreasing down towards negative infinity. Again, because the two sides are not approaching the same value, we would say another uh, no limit or does not exist. 
Okay. And then here for uh, f of x, uh, this one was saying uh, function is 0 when x is less than or equal to 0. So we got this horizontal line here. And then the function is sine of 1 over x when x is greater than 0. And that's the portion on the right here. And again, the story is similar. The, the function does not appear to be approaching a single value from both sides. From the left, it's approaching 0. But from the right, as we go towards the left, uh, it's oscillating. We call this oscillating. It's, it's fluctuating between various values. Looks like it's between negative 1 and 1. It's just going to keep oscillating. So it's not going to limit to one particular value. So again, because the values do not match from both sides, this will be the limit does not exist. Okay. okay, so here we have our limit laws. You could have various um, rules for the limit. If you have two functions that are added together, you could take their limits individually and then add them together, and that would be your sum rule. If you have two functions, you could take their limits like, separately and then subtract them. And you can subtract the limits and that would be the difference rule. If you have a constant times a function, you could take the limit of the function as x is approaching c and then just multiply by the constant. Okay. You have a product rule where you multiply the products, quotient rule where you could divide the two limits, power rule Right, if the limit is some value, you could raise it to the power. The root rule. Okay, so all these rules apply to our limits. Okay, so let's take a look at example five. Here we have a few of these limits. Let's try to evaluate them. So in part A, it says take the limit as x approaches c of this polynomial. Okay, And one of the typ typical things we do with a polynomial, when we see it's approaching some value, we plug in the value in place of our variable. Okay, And then we try to evaluate. So here, the c would go in for x. Let me just plug in. And because we're just plugging another variable, we cannot evaluate this. We would leave this the way to. Okay, so we have c cubed plus 4c squared minus 3. Okay, let's take a look at part b. Find the limit as x approaches c for this rational function. So we again plug it in, c to the fourth plus c squared minus 1 over c squared plus 5. And we would leave it like that. Okay, for part c, limit as x approaches negative 2. So here we plug in negative 2. Whenever you plug in a negative value, I would always recommend... Uh, parentheses and so we're going to do uh, order of operations negative 2 squared is 4 and then we'll multiply by the 4 so we have 16 and then subtract 3 And so we finally end up with square root of 13. And if you cannot break it down any further, you can leave it the way it is. 13 is prime. So we just have square root of 13. Okay. Let's take a look at our next example. We kind of just covered this. Limits of polynomials. 
again if you have a polynomial and your limit is approaching a certain value you plug in that value everywhere there's uh, a variable and then you just evaluate okay if you have uh, rational functions again you plug in your your plug in your variable into the two functions and then you evaluate the one thing you want to watch out for with rational functions is if your denominator turns out to be zero and if it does turn out to be zero for a denominator uh, you try to if possible uh, algebraically work it out so that it's not zero sometimes it's unavoidable but uh, sometimes you could do a few key steps and and see what it really comes out to be okay and we'll, co we'll cover a few of those cases okay let's take a look at example six it says find the limit as x approaches negative one for this function so we plug in negative one so negative one cubed plus 4 times negative 1 squared minus 3 negative 1 squared plus 5 and now we just evaluate using uh, order of operations uh, PEMDAS right negative 1 cubed is negative 1 plus negative 1 squared is 1 negative 1 squared is 1 Okay, and now we could simplify the top. We have negative 1 minus 3, that's negative 4, plus 4, that's a 0. 1 plus 5 is 6. 0 over 6, so remember 0 over any non-zero number would be 0. Okay, so 0 is okay. 0 on the top is okay. 0 on the bottom not okay okay so let's take a look at what happens here uh, so we have we find the limit as x approaches 1 so 1 squared plus 1 minus 2 1 squared minus 1 okay so notice we have 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2 and then the bottom is 1 squared is 1 minus 1 we end up with 0 over 0 okay so this is a case we don't want we don't want 0 over 0 so we try a different technique a common technique when we see polynomials uh, like in this case rational functions we try to factor out any common factor okay like with the opening example if we could factor the top and factor the bottom and have any common factors cancel out then we can proceed and, and try to figure out um, what the, the the limit would be okay so let's try to factor at the top so typical polynomial x squared would factor into x and x what multiplies to negative 2 and adds up to positive 1 that would be a plus 2 and a minus 1. Okay, for your denominator, x squared minus x, we could pull out an x. All right, if we pull out an x, we're left with x minus 1. Okay, notice the common factor of x minus 1. We can cross that out. So now we're left with x plus 2 over x and then what we do from here we take the limit as x approaches 1 okay so now plug in 1 so 1 plus 2 over 1 which gives us 3 over 1 which gives us 3 so it looks like the limit did exist and it was 3 
So common technique, factor, any common factors that cancel, that's great. And then you continue with the original limit and plug in as usual. Okay. Let's take a look at another technique. Again, this is a common technique. It says evaluate the limit as x approaches 0. So notice what happens if we plug in 0. We end up with uh, 0 squared plus 100 minus 10 over 0 squared. So in the square root, we get square root of 100, which is 10. And then 0 squared is 0. 10 minus 10 is 0. So again, again, the, we get the indeterminate form of 0 over 0. Okay, so we don't want that. So what can we do? So here's a technique we could use in a scenario like this. I'm just going to rewrite the problem. So what we end up doing here is we end up multiplying by what's called the conjugate of the numerator. Right? So the way that works is we multiply top and bottom of this function by, it would be the same two terms that you have here. The only difference is the sign in the middle. The sign in the middle is the opposite sign. So we multiply by x squared plus 100 plus 10 over x squared plus 100 plus 10. Okay, so now what happens with that? Well, the top part we could FOIL, right? pretend like it's uh, two binomials. So the top part, we could FOIL it out. Now when you do the square root times the square root, you're undoing the square root. So you have x squared plus 100. And then you have the plus 10 square root minus 10 square root. Those two would cancel. And then you have minus 10 times plus 10, that would be minus 100. Okay, and on the bottom, on the bottom you just have x squared times x squared plus 100 plus 10. Okay, so we could simplify here. Right, notice how we have the plus 100 minus 100. So we're left with x squared over x squared times the square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10. Okay, and then we have a common factor of x squared. We cross those out. So we're left with 1 over square root of x squared plus 100 plus 10. And that would be as far as we could take it. So now we could take the limit as x approaches 0 and we could plug in like usual. Okay, so we have 1 over square root of 0 squared plus 100 which gives us 0 plus 100 is 100 square root of 100 
plus 10. We get the square root of 100 is 10. And we finally end up with 1 over 20. Okay, so this is a very common technique. It's called multiplying by the uh, conjugate of the numerator. And you could avoid uh, an indeterminate form like we did. Okay, any questions, just write me an email and bring it up during the lecture. Have a good day. We'll see you soon.